Hello team FD and welcome back to Winners and Losers, where we make sense of the weekend's best action in the Premier League. Joining me on today's show, as he normally does, is Joseph Tomlinson. How was your weekend, Carrot Top? It was good, mate. Obviously, we went to Cirque du Soleil on, on Friday. What an experience that is, mate. And I have to say, I've also dodged a few winners and losers recently. I say dodged, I've had... Uh, other things on but I've actually not been on one for a couple of weeks so I'm excited to be back yeah I will say that you not being on it coincidence that it coincided with Manchester United's downturn yeah. in form <laughs> what I will level at you though is late to do the Sunday vibes thumbnail went up at 12 o'clock instead of nine people were annoyed with this Joe in the comments well I blame you mate for sending me the images for the thumbnail late there you go yeah we almost fell out on Saturday night but let's move on to our talking point before we rip through our winners losers and round off the show with our moment of the week now the talking point this week because there was plenty of winners is going to be Manchester United after their 3-2 yeah, victory at Ellen Road the first time they played in front of a full Ellen Road in 17 years uh, so it's a highly anticipated fixture. And Jaden Sancho starred once more. Talk about a, a resurrection, a renaissance in his Manchester United career. It's taken six months, but he's finally firing on all cylinders. I think he had one goal in his first 17 Premier League outings. He's now put up three goals and assists in the last three games. Crazy that his assists yesterday were his first of the campaign, given that he was putting up a league assist every other game at Borussia Dortmund. And even more satisfyingly for Ranjik, I guess, Tomlinson, is that Sancho's all-round game is starting to come to the fore, isn't it? No player, United player, registered more dribbles than Sancho uh, in the midweek victory over Brighton. He was second to Pogba in this regard against Leeds. Only Scott McTominay and Bruno Fernandes completed more pressures off the ball in the win over Leeds. And I'm sure that will really tickle Ranić's pickle uh, and nobody made more passes in the final third than Sancho at a rain soaked a sodden Ellen Road uh, he was just bloody superb wasn't he so what I wanted to ask you at the very start of the show was quite a punchy question um, who do you think United's most important forward is Ooh. as of now and what do you attribute to Sancho's uptick in form. I think United's most important forward uh, remains Bruno Fernandes. I think Bruno Fernandes is playing really well at the moment. Uh, if he's finishing, still lacking a little bit. A great had it yesterday down into the ground, but in previous weeks missing a fair few sitters. But I think that is 20 goal involvements for the season in all competitions in just over 30 games Woof. and he's not taking penalties anymore. So that argument from rival fans kind of in the mud there, isn't it? Uh, Jadon Sancho's uptick, I think, largely comes down to the fact he's playing on a much more consistent basis in a consistent position uh, and in a consistent style. I think when he first came in, he was kind of in and out of the side. He was on the right, he was on the left, he even had a little bit of time in the middle. Now it's very much he's going to be playing out on that left-hand side. He's playing pretty much uh, the full 90 of every single game at the moment. And it's really happened mm. since that sort of weird little mid-international break. Yeah. Since he's come back from that, he seems to have reset, refound his confidence. And it also does just take a bit of time to adapt to the speed of the Premier League at times, doesn't it? We see it with pretty much every player that arrives in the league. It takes six months to get up to pace with it. It's not as if you can just snap your fingers and suddenly you are playing at the speed and intensity of everyone around you. He also had that uh, really bad moment at the Euros where he missed the penalty in the finals. I'm sure that knocked his confidence too. So when you are a forward, when you are a winger, it does come down to confidence moments I think especially when you're a skillful winger like Sancho who is extremely good in the 1v1 um, I also think I really believe that the arrival or the return of Paul Pogba has helped Jadon Sancho a lot I think his gravity pulling people away from Jadon Sancho also his ability to find Jadon Sancho and create chances too when you've not just got an over-reliance of one player and you can say, okay, Bruno's creating chances, Sancho's creating chances, Pogba's creating chances, then you've got a much more uh, cohesive unit. So I think all of these factors have seen Jadon Sancho refined. I don't think he's fully at his best yet, no. but he just looks so calm and composed on the ball. It's great to see. I also think there was a bit of a fundamental misunderstanding as to the player he was developing into uh, at Borussia Dortmund when he first came over to the Premier League. Because of the nature of some of Borussia Dortmund's counter-attacking goals, I think a lot of Premier League fans thought he was this 
speedster in transition, thought he was just like you know really aggressive and, and vertical player. When when really he's he's a playmaker, isn't he? He likes to receive the ball mm. in the final third. His touches in and around the box with with other players absolutely delightful. And when he forms stronger relationships with those players, with Bruno, with Pogba, I imagine we'll see that uh, come to the fore a little bit more. Let's talk about the rest of the forward line then. Now, Ronaldo and Lingard, not vintage performances mm. from them. What did you, you make of their their various 90s? Well, not even 90s because they were both hauled off, weren't they? Their various games. I mean, this was for Lingard's first start since New Year's Day 2020 in the Premier League for Manchester United, wasn't it? So it's not a particular surprise that he didn't hit the ground running, uh, given how little football he's played. It is going to take time to get up to speed. As for Cristiano Ronaldo, he's having a bit of a struggle in 2022, isn't mm. he? Uh, not quite found his rhythm yet, it feels like. I think it's just the one goal so far this year. And admittedly, it was a fantastic goal, wasn't it, against Brighton. The way he takes it, moves it and hits it within sort of half a second is just sublime. Uh, and I'm not too worried. I'm not too worried because you just don't write Cristiano Ronaldo off. He will start finding his shooting boots again, won't he? And obviously, Atletico Madrid coming up on Wednesday. I believe he's got 25 goals in 35 games against Atletico Madrid. So I'm sure he'll be licking his lips about the prospect of that tie. The issue for Ronaldo is if he's not scoring goals, doesn't add an awful lot else to the team because he's not pressing high. He's not creating chances. He's not drip dropping deep and supporting the midfield. He is really at this stage of his career a penalty box poacher and he is missing some quite big chances that leads uh, one where Pogba absolutely pulls Adam Forshaw's pants down puts it across the box he's about six yards out should really score there was a couple of headers against Brighton and it's been a bit of a consistent theme in 2022 him missing very key chances I'm not worried because he will start scoring again but the sooner the better, please, Cristiano. The sooner the better. Yeah, like you said, not a massive margin for error when you've got a score to justify your position in the side. I mean, mm. a more high-stakes game for Lingard, let's say, because opportunities have been so few and far between. Yeah. Zero take-ons, zero shots, zero touches inside the opposition's box. Did a fair share of work off the ball, put up a couple of tackles, but lost possession five times, which is a team high. I feel like this was his opportunity to seize more minutes in the run-in and he didn't really take it. Again, not going to be too critical of him because like you said, he's probably a little bit rusty. But when Anthony Lang is coming off the bench and making the impression that he does, uh, going to be very difficult to fight his way back into the side, I imagine, or the starting 11, let's say. Um, I actually wanted to touch upon something else before we move on to our winners, which is something you tweeted about February the 14th. Don't worry, I've not dug up any dirt. It was your mm, graph. Worried. Uh, your stats bomb graph, wherein you commented ah. that uh, this, is, this is actually prior to the, the victories over Brighton and Leeds as well. So um, you put, it's a shame that the circus around the club will eventually overshadow any good work being done. And I just wanted, you know, to use this as a platform to talk about the good work that Ranić is doing because I think mm. everyone has now arrived at the conclusion he's not going to get the job on a permanent basis or, and that United are, you know, still struggling, still just about getting by. But the underlying numbers are a little bit more promising, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, United's XG difference is heading in a, in a really positive fashion. And if you look at the underlying numbers uh, across his tenure, they are steadily getting better and better and better. And United have missed so many big chances in the last month. It is unbelievable. Believable. If those start flying in, then I really do believe United are close to clicking. At the moment, we still are 45 minutes FC to a level, although yesterday I thought we were pretty much dominant for 80 minutes, maybe mm. 90, maybe 70, 80 minutes off the 90 minutes. So a uh, much more positive performance. But we've been working in 45-minute patches, not being able to put the full 90 together, whether that's because of fitness, whether that's because of uh, mentality problems, I'm not too sure. But, you know, we've conceded just eight goals in 11 league games. Games Manchester United under Ralph Rannick. This is a team that were all over the place at the back under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. It's hard to deny that he has shored up the defence. I'm sure when he first came in, his number one priority was shore up the defence and then we'll get the attack working. And that is effectively what's happened. And obviously that is partly down to the form of David De Gea, who's working at, I think, plus 10 non-penalty, uh, plus 10 like post-shot expected goals, something like that, mm. which is just ridiculous. I think it's the best in Europe. Certainly the most saves of any goalkeeper in the Premier League, that's for sure. Um, but I also feel like it's because Man United have become much more organised in a 4-3-3, where Bruno and Pogba play much tighter to Scott McTominay. There's way more support for the full 
fullbacks from Jaden Sancho and a player like Jesse Lingard. And I also believe, I don't know what you think, Chris, but Rangnick really got things like substitutions right mm. yesterday. There was a moment against Aston Villa where he got his subs wrong, and I think he admitted it in his post-match press conference when we were 2-0 up. Should have gone to three at the back. I think since then he's learned that he needs to be a little bit quicker with his, with his substitutions and in-game management. And I think yesterday was a perfect example. When he, when he hauled Paul Pogba off, I thought, what is he doing here? Paul Pogba, in my opinion, was dictating the whole game yesterday for the first 45 minutes. Fred comes on, a little bit more energy. I thought he was superb for the final 30 minutes. Scored his goal. Alanga, another sub, gets his goal. And I think he deserves a little bit more praise for that. Yeah, and he's, he's made bold, brave substitutions as well, hasn't he? And not been scared to haul the likes of Pogba and Ronaldo off on a consistent basis. And I think entrusting Alanga with the amount of minutes that he has uh, and reversing Jaden Sancho's form whilst doing the things you just mentioned will pretty much be his legacy when he steps into that off the pitch position. And it will be a perfectly serviceable legacy. Just to compound the points you were raising, United conceded 21 goals in the previous 12 games under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And like you said, Ranić's in-game tweak started to feel a little bit more surgical as the season goes on obviously a new manager has to find his feet in that regards he needs to work out who he can trust you know who's going to bring what to the game when when they come on and uh, Alanga seems to be his go-to guy mm. United have now scored 10 Premier League goals via substitutions by the way this season which is at least four more than any other side so yeah starting to be very productive off the bench uh, before we finish this segment then I wanted to ask you what mm. forward line would you start against Atletico uh, I think I would stick with the 4-3-3 and I would stick with Sancho uh, Ronaldo and then I would have Rashford playing on the right interesting Rashford so you don't think Alanga's done enough to warrant a starting position no I think Alanga's better as an impact sub right now and that's going to be a real cauldron atmosphere it's a tough tough game mm. to ask Alanga to come in uh, and perform in a Champions League round of 16 game away at Atletico Madrid I think I would go for Rashford's pace on the break okay interesting I think that's fairly sensible and what I would say is that I would stick with Ronaldo for the next two oppositions which are uh Atletico Madrid and Watford sitting defences, you know, where United's wide players are going to have time and space on the ball to try and find Ronaldo in that six yard box. But after that, Manchester United play City, Tottenham, Atletico again uh, and Liverpool. And I think it is probably worth trying Bruno Fernandes maybe as a false nine in those games just to wrestle possession from the opposition a little bit more in the centre of the park. Pogba, Fred, McTominay maybe behind him. Uh, using Alanga's pace, using his uh, 23 pressures per 90 to put the their back lines, I'm, I'm talking City, I'm talking Liverpool here, under a little bit more pressure. I, I don't know if I'd persist with Ronaldo in those games where you expect to be back against the walls, but like you said, never rule him out. He does love a big, big game. Uh, let us know your thoughts in the comments below as to the starting 11 for United's upcoming fixtures. Um, anyway... For all their improvement on the defensive end, Ranić's side have still only kept two clean sheets in the last 10 Premier League outings. So, little surprise to see the Germans' reaction post-match was more cautionary than celebratory. Yes, of course. I mean, we have to, to, to win most of the games that we have to play in the future. That we are fully aware of that. If we, if we want, it, want to finish uh, fourth in the league, we cannot afford to, to lose and drop uh, uh, any more points, even more so when, when you're one or two nil up. And that's why this was a massive win today. Our winner this week then is the one and only Harold Kane. Now, we weren't in short supply for potential winners. Of course, Burnley thrashed Brighton. Arsenal closed the gap on West Ham. Wolves' sneak attack in the Champions League continued. But this is probably one of the best individual performances we've seen this season, right, Joe? So before we get into the numbers, give me your thoughts. Yeah, the, I mean, he was just outrageous in this game, wasn't he? I actually think it was one of the best individual performances for a sort of back-to-the-walls team against a really elite side like Man City that I've ever seen. Like, he was just everywhere doing everything. His passing range is just ridiculous off mm. of both feet, holding the ball up. He destroyed Ruben Diaz and Imeric Laporte for 90 minutes. They did not have a clue what to do with Harry Kane. And it kind of bears fruit in the numbers, isn't it? 13 final third passes, four duels, one, three shots, three shots on target, two chances created, two goals. 
I mean, I'm not sure what more Harry Kane could have done in this game. It was a genuine 10 out of 10 performance. I think the only slight error was when he missed the one-on-one. -on -one. Edison saving really well down low to his left with his left boot. But overall, this was just absolutely masterful and pretty much showed exactly why Pep Guardiola was willing to stump up 150 odd million pounds in the summer. And it... it didn't end up coming to anything, but you know, I don't think I was the only one that thought this was. I think half of the footballing world thought this, including Jamie Carragher. That was one of the best performances I've seen this season. It really was uh, a privilege to watch it, really. And what made it so much more special was that we've seen players do, you know, play in a game and score a couple of goals, create one, play nice passes, but he didn't get a lot of the balls. So every time the ball came into him, even little one touches, little flick ons, little headers, little touches around the corner, everything he did was just pure class today. It really was. <laughs> It's actually one of those football oddities that Harry Kane's record against City, not great prior to this game, despite producing a yeah. great 90 here. Only had two goals in 13 games against Manchester City in all competitions before going into this game. And this was the first time in his career he's actually scored against a side managed by Pep Guardiola. But... Like you said, put on an absolute show. And one number that we dug out that kind of illustrates just how well-rounded a centre-forward is in the Premier League, the most well-rounded centre-forward in the Premier League, was the fact he made 10 Definitely. passes into the final third in this match, which was the most of any striker in any given 90 of Premier League action this term. Uh, it's also got to be said that his strike partner, Son, played very, very well, didn't he? Got two assists in this yeah. game, taking his tally to 14 goals and assists in 20 starts. Another superb season from him. He is Mr. Consistency and he's also Mr. Nice. Let's hear what he had to say about Harry Kane after the game. I was really sad at the uh, start of season when he didn't score the goals and people were talking and I was quite sad because he was working for the team and he was playing for the team. I mean, uh, you could see today as well, he was working hard. He was he was uh, with the defenders. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable, unbelievable player as well. But I mean, unbelievable guy, you know. I mean, on to our loser then. And I am feeling a little bit smug. It's Steven Gerrard. <laughs> One win in their last seven games means they're pretty much back to where they started before he came in, before he took Dean Smith's place. I said this on the How to Fix Aston Villa podcast. Not convinced at all. He was a significant upgrade on Dean Smith. And here we are. Now, admittedly, the start of this poor run was against strong opposition, wasn't it? Chelsea, Liverpool, City in the league. And they actually fared pretty well in those games against those top, top sides. They also played Manchester United in back-to-back -back games in the Premier League and FA Cup. Don't know if... Don't know if we regarded Manchester United as, as top, top opposition back then when they were still struggling, but still. And United should have won that game. But still. Should have won that game. Yeah. Threw it away, 2-0 up. Recent losses to Brentford, Newcastle and Watford have definitely taken the shine off the Gerrard regime, haven't they, Tomlinson? I mean, I yeah. don't know how closely you watch this game or how closely you've been monitoring Villa's progress in recent weeks, but what have you made of the situation uh, that's starting to unfurl? Well, I mean, Steven Gerrard was not happy before the game, was he? He was saying, we need to show some resilience. We need to fight back, don't we? And I, I thought they were extremely disappointing against a very mediocre Watford side. I know Roy Hodgson has shored up the back line, hasn't he? I think mm. he's kept as many clean sheets uh, in in his tenure already as they did in the previous 36 games. What a guy. But... Uh, for Aston Villa, it just feels a little bit muddled all over the pitch at the moment, doesn't it? I know that they're trying to squeeze players. It's almost a little bit round pegs in square hole syndrome at the moment, isn't it? You know, Danny Ings not quite working the way they wanted him to. Obviously, cost £25 million and featured in all but eight games in the previous two seasons. But now... Doesn't really look like he fits in the team mm. when Ollie Watkins wants to play through the middle and Coutinho wants to play and Bailey wants to play and Buendia wants to play and Jacob Ramsey's in there as well. The defending off the ball, just so poor against Watford. It really was. Even some of the most energetic players on the field, like John McGinn, I thought looked, looked lazy getting to balls, looked slow getting to balls. Leon Bailey, you know... I mean, the impact's just been non-existent, hasn't it? Obviously, he's had terrible injury problems, but they've not quite worked out these Jack Grealish replacements in the way Aston Villa fans wanted them to. And they were 14th when Smith left. Uh, they're two points off of 14th now. So there's not been a significant upgrade mm. at the moment. Gerard is struggling, and I'm sure Aston Villa fans still back him. And let's have it right, hasn't been there long enough to be questioned, but... 
uh, he will not be happy with his team's performances recently. I mean, the prevailing narrative amongst the fan base now is that, you know, it wasn't Dean Smith, it was the players. The Aston Villa fans, at least in the comments that I've seen on various articles, are starting to lose their patience with, with several of these yeah. first team players. Uh, as well as the fact that Gerard is, is having to contend with uh, signings that Dean Smith made, high risk signings that Dean Smith made. Uh, bringing in injury play, injury prone players like Danny Ings, like Leon Bailey, which I don't f fully buy. You know, there might be some credence to the first point we just raised, but like you said, Danny Ings featured in all but eight games in the previous two seasons. Leon Bailey featured in 30 games in the Bundesliga last season. Coutinho, who was the uh, is is now you know Aston Villa's jewel in the crown, uh, only only played 13 games across the previous two seasons for Barcelona. It's not like he's uh, nailed on fitness-wise, yeah. is it? So don't really buy that. But um, but yeah, they've got to pick themselves up very quickly if they're for, to fulfil Christian Perslow's ambitions of being a top 10 Premier League side. I mean, Perslow has spent enough money to probably think that he should be seeing something that resembles a top half side out there on that turf, right? But... So that's just not the case at the moment. And their next game is against very tricky opposition in a wounded Brighton, of course, lost yeah. to Burnley. Gerald has already beat them this season, so maybe there'll be a certain degree of confidence going into that game. But if things don't start going their way, they're going to be dragged into a very sticky situation, Tom Allison. Five points off 17th at the moment. And I think Everton, the likes of Everton, have a game in hand, although some others around them have played more. So very hard to, to get the lay of the land at the minute, isn't it, with all those games in hand. Um, but like you said, Gerard was prior to the match saying that some players might not be uh, around Aston Villa all that long. I imagine he felt even more so afterwards. At, at this level of the game, in, in this league, one of the best leagues in the world, I think on a daily basis, you're always playing for your future. Uh, I, I don't think that ever changes. Um, you know, I can certainly back and echo what Christian's saying. I think we all share that feeling from the top of the club down. Uh, we want to finish the season strong. All right, then let's round off the show with our moments of the week, Joseph. Uh, what are you going for? Because you never normally pick the ones that I give you anyway. Uh, it's got to be Woot. Big Woot Weghorst, I think. Six foot six. What a finish as well against Brighton. And it was a fantastic Bernie performance. I know they're missing Duncan Webster. And obviously that is a shit show for uh, Graham Potter. But... I just like the fact he got so emotional, smacked it in, he was brilliant all day, turned around, a few little tears, got back on with the game, bullied the Brighton <laughs> defence, love it, big whoop. Yeah, it was an unreal finish, fair play. Let me know your yeah. moments of the week in the comments below and I'll get back to you in the first hour. That is all for today's show. Make sure you like this video and subscribe to Football Daily with notifications on. What else should people go and watch across Football Daily, Europe Football Daily uh, and the podcast channel, Joe? Yeah, go and watch Sunday Vibes yesterday if you haven't already. Obviously, it went up slightly late. A bit of debate over who was to blame there, but we're not getting into that right now because it is a really Scum. good video. We're going through our most overrated Champions League 11. Oh, you know and what? There are some big names in there that have caused some controversy in the comments. Pato's taking pelters in the comments this morning for his Luca Hernandez for what? suggestion. Is he? Yeah, absolute pelters. So go and Ooh. let us know what you think in the Sunday Vibes comments, and we'll uh, see you next time. Bye.